cars will be coming out onto track any moment and of course these are uh, the historic cars indeed the oldest cars we're going to see over the course of the weekend cars that would have raced at brooklands and other places like that cars basically from the 1920s and 1930s on the pole position there it is fred wakeman in the silver number 11 car uh, that is the fraser nash alongside him is the bentley of clive morley and then Watch out on the second row, the tiny little three-wheeled Morgan of Sue Derbyshire. Next to her is Mike Grant-Peterkin. He's starting this race in car number seven. That is uh, the Lee Francis. So we'll see how they get on as we get ready for the start. About to go lights out and we have got the start of the pre-war brdc 500 away we go and it's a good start from the pole man fred wakeman this is a two driver race it's a longer distance race than we have seen so far the bentley up into second position and it looks as though sue derbyshire and the morgan is missing out a bit with that initial straight line speed alistair that's pretty much what you've got to expect quick car in the wet she might struggle a bit more in the dry very much so yes her top speed is only about 105 miles an hour which is enough for a three-wheel car but uh, not as much as some of the bigger bentleys and uh, the, the larger engine cars so she will lose out but uh, fred wakeman is not losing out he's the owner of this car he'll hand over to patrick Lake, yeah, which is the of the race. So what we're going to see in this race ben is the, the drivers are sitting on top of the cars almost they sit on them not in them and we get a great view of them uh, wrestling with the wheel as they go through the corners yeah, well, it is a good start by Fred Wakeman, who heads down in towards Brooklyn's corner. Great uh, difference in cars and sizes and power. Uh, you can see the little Morgan coming through in the middle there, uh, the three-wheeler. You can see that it has lost a, a few places, but it's still well up the head of a huge number of cars. Again, it's another big, big grid of cars. There are about 35, oh, it is 35 car entry this year in the... BDC 500, the pre-war machinery, and there is the Fraser Nash heading around in the lead of the race for now with an advantage over Clive Morley. Clive's not sharing his car with anybody, but he will have to make a pit stop and they'll have a pause. A little bit of a, a pressure here right now for that second place. As, uh, quite close, uh, Gareth Burnett. Now Gareth Burnett is in third place, actually, he's doing well, and is chasing after that second position. Yes, that's a good battle for second, isn't it? But Fred Wakeman has opened up a little bit of a gap, but not much as they come through Beckett's, and uh, you can see Fred Wakeman is really sitting out in the breeze there, and you can see him working away at the wheel, just coaxing the car through the corner, a little bit of understeer, then oversteer, but it's all under control. Fred Wakeman, the UK dominant style, the American, and uh, down onto the hangar straight they go, and a good run from Burnett. Yeah, Gareth Burnett is really going well in the Alta here. The Alta was a British uh, sports car made in the 1930s, and in fact, it was kind of the predecessor to many great British sports cars that came along later post-war. He's really on the attack, and uh, he's closing up to Fred Wakeman, so we could have a bit of a battle going on for the lead now. A very pretty little machine, that Alta, as it heads on around and chased by the Bentley of Clive Morley, who's just dropped back a fraction on this lap. And guess who Gareth Burnett's handing over to? A certain Richard Bradley. So uh, <laughs> Rich, Richard might, uh, certainly at the moment, he's in a podium position for the first two races of the weekend. Yeah. And uh, there we see the big Bentley, number 22, of Clive Morley, who, as you say, is driving solo. The other two will sh uh, hand the car over at the pit stop. Down they come, and uh, Fred Wakeman just turning in there uh, into Abbey, up towards Farm, and then the tight right-hander at Village. Is this where Gareth Burnett will be able to close up? Yeah, that's a good question. We'll wait to see, but at the moment it's still the Fraser Nash, car number 11, that is leading, oh, slightly deep into the corner. Gareth went a little bit too deep, in fact. He's had some good success here at Silverstone in the past, though, and he is a very rapid racer. Fred getting a bit sideways as he comes through the loop and now through entry, but dealing with it well, reaching that right arm over the side of the cockpit to change gear. Uh, he's glancing down a bit there. Um, I don't know whether he's just tucking. He may just be tucking his head down, down the straight. They do do that, of course, because you want a little less drag. I think that's all he's doing. Down the long straight, tucking his head down, reduce the amount of drag. Nice little battle going on further back as well. One of the uh, Talbot Largos in there. Group battle there as well as they head down towards Brooklyn. Some very pretty machinery. Another of the big Bentleys. The Bentleys that dominated at Le Mans in the 1920s and uh, doing a pretty good job here today as well. Coming through side by side on the last side here, the blue car, that's the number 
five car of Richard Tilkington, who is sharing with his daughter Tanya in the Talbot T26 SS. And uh, comes through Luffield and gets ahead of that little group as they go out towards Woodford Corner. A very pretty car, and we mentioned yesterday almost some aerodynamics on that car pre war with the fared in wheel arches. There you can see the Morgan of the Sedona. Well, currently in sixth position. Fantasy well in that group. Car number 14 is leading that next little group. That's until Vector Schneider in his uh, target to Lombardo. He's coming under pressure from the other one, isn't he? So, a bit of side by side action between two very similar cars. And behind them is one of the uh, Aston Martin speed models, uh, the Alan Middleton car, as they come through Beckett's. Nice to see the two Talbots together and uh, almost side by side. They're quite big cars. Uh, compared to some of the others in this race, but they do go side by side, uh, absolutely, with uh, Till Beckelsheimer on the outside, Richard Tilkington on the inside as they go down there, and we're back with Fred Wakeman, the leader. Yeah, back with Fred Wakeman. Remember, if you want to make any comments or uh, have anything to tell me about what's going on that you're seeing from elsewhere around the track, at Ben Edwards TV is my Twitter, uh, so give us uh, a buzz and we'll uh, try and pass on any information that we can to you. As our race leader opening up a useful advantage here, let's just see what the gap is now. 4.2 seconds, this is a really good opening stint from Fred and in fact Pat Blakeney Edwards just as quick if not quicker to be honest when he takes over that car, they've got a real chance of opening up a, a healthy lead. Mind you, Alistair, these are old cars. Reliability uh, could be a factor. Of course, they're all beautifully prepared nowadays, but it's something you've got to think about. Yes, absolutely. And there, there was a, a similar length race for these cars earlier in the year, and uh, they uh, all but one finished. It was amazing to see. There's Sue Derbyshire now. She's uh, driving her Morgan three-wheeler Super Aero, which has a top speed, as I mentioned earlier, of 105 miles an hour. Just two gears, and like the leading car, it's chain-driven. So uh, two chains on the car, two cogs. You move the chain from one cog to the other to change gear, and uh, a little twin-cylinder V-shaped uh, engine at the front, hanging out at the front between the front wheels, and uh, she's making her way through towards uh, Aintree now, and uh, she's not lost as many places as perhaps she might have expected on this very fast open circuit with this little car. Yeah, I just think fabulous job. You think three wheels, and yet you've got that grip, uh, you've got this little tiny engine here, uh, but it's working with the Derbyshire. Here she is, throwing the Morgan around, quick down change, links it into the left hand of Look at the size of that steering wheel. The steering wheel looks bigger than everything else in the car, doesn't it? She leans into the corner. It's a bit like riding a motorbike. Her body weight is important to help the car back into the corner. And lifting a front wheel there as she turned in, and a little bit of sideways there. It's the rear wheel that's driven, not the single wheel. Front wheels, obviously, uh, but uh, actually lifting that inside front wheel as she leaned over, as you said, to keep the weight on the inside. She's chased by Alexander Hewitt in a rather beautiful Riley. Uh, it's the Riley 12.4 TT, a uh, Sprite replica built in 1937. Uh, Sue's car, the Morgan, uh, that uh, is dated from 1929. There it is. And uh, so you've got cars from a very different era racing here today. But we're, we're seeing cars today that go back this far, so to the 1920s, we've got uh, these older cars. And we'll be seeing cars later on today, as recent as 2015, some amazing LMP sports prototype cars that we'll also be watching racing today. So it's a massive cross-section of machinery, but uh, that's what the Classic is all about, providing us with all sorts of different cars to enjoy and different types of racing as well. And these beautiful classic pre-war cars, no roll cages, no seat belts, just sitting up high in the cockpit, uh, often with a passenger seat. In the old days, they would often race with a mechanic alongside, wouldn't they? Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, some of the cars were converted from two-seat road cars into sort of semi-single-seaters. Talbot did that with their Grand Prix car. They took a, uh, a, what was effectively a, a road car. But uh, we see uh, the car we saw there at the, at the front, the light blue car, running in the colours of France, because at this time, the uh, teams were obliged to run in their country's colours. Uh, so although that Bentley is blue, and that's Duncan Wiltshire's Bentley, uh, most of the Bentleys were green because the racing colour for Britain was green. Duncan Wiltshire is the man behind Motor Racing Legends, MRL, which is uh, organising this particular race, and he's owned this Bentley for many, many years. And 
and uh, actually a few years ago, Ben, before Duncan got hold of it, it was used on a farm to tow a plough. Uh, it wasn't valued, wow. it was just a machine on a, on a farm and it would tow the plough around. Uh, but Duncan had it fully rebuilt and it's a beautiful car now as he makes his way around through uh, the Vale into Club Corner. Yeah, no, it's, it's lovely to see that, an amazing story that it was used as a, as a tractor effectively. And he's being chased by the Riley Brookmans, isn't he? That's uh, another very pretty little car right behind. Car number 12, that's uh, Nigel Dowding. This was a very successful car back in the 1930s in the sort of lower uh, categories. Um, it was a modification of the Riley 9, beautiful car in its day. The Riley Brookmans, a sort of lowered uh, version. Reed Rails, one of the great designers of the 1930s, had a, an input, in fact, in the design of the Riley Brooklands and it's uh, chasing after the Bentley at this stage. Up front, uh, no doubt about our race leader, though. It is uh, still Fred Wakeman, who's built up an advantage of some uh, 12 seconds, a big, big advantage, also setting fastest laps out there. So it looks as though the Fraser Nash is definitely in the car. Now, we're looking a bit further down the field, car number eight. That's an Alvis, Alvis Firefly, with Rudiger Friedrichs, who is at the wheel. Beautiful machine again, 4.3 litre engine. That's a, that's a big power horse, isn't it? Oh, sorry, am I looking at the wrong one? Tell me what it is, Alison. That, that's the Jaguar with the twin wheels. Sorry, sorry, yes. Very easy to, to uh, mistake, actually, the both dark colored cars. That's John Burton's ah, Jaguar yes, SS100. Yes. Sorry, yes. Uh, prior to being called Jaguar, the name of the company was SS, SS Cars. But of, obviously, after the Second War, the connotations of the SS, they changed it to Jaguar. Uh, but uh, it's entered, actually, as a Jaguar SS. Great to see it out there. Lovely, uh, yeah. With, of with course. The, SS becoming Jaguar, and we are going to see a lot of Jaguars as we go through today, aren't we? We've got this E-Type race um, as well coming up later today, celebrating 60 years of the Jaguar E-Type. But as you say, it all kind of started off with the SS. We've got one out there today, which is lovely. There's our race leader. Uh, the gap he's built up, look, 17 seconds now, uh, up to Clive Morley. So Clive Morley into second place. What's happened to Gareth Burnett? He seems to have dropped away, doesn't he? We saw him up there doing a, a, a fine job earlier, and I don't know whether yes, he's had a un problem. Unfortunately, he retired. Oh, yes, and he's okay. pulled off. That's a great shame. So, just well, Gareth Burnett, he was due to hand the car over to Richard Bradley, who won the opening race of the day in the Formula Junior. So, that's a great shame. They've obviously had a, a reliability problem on that car, and it looks as though we're not going to see any more of that beautiful Alta Sports, which is a great shame. I have to say that's one of my uh, favourite cars that's out there. But they're all lovely, um, so difficult to choose. So our race leader now has a, a bigger advantage than uh, earlier on, nearly 20 seconds. There will be a pit stop that uh, when the pit window opens up. It is a 40-minute um, race in total. So halfway through, uh, we're expecting the pit stops to be made. I have to say, the Fraser Nash, it really sits the driver up high, doesn't it? Look at the work going on at the steering wheel. Yes, and that's a, another chain-driven car, so the, uh, the external gear change is moving the chain, the cop, the chain on the cogs, and uh, he getting up towards Cop's corner, and he'll be handing over, and a little uh, acknowledgement there of his pit board, so I think we'll see Fred come in next time around. I think that was him acknowledging that they're saying pit in, and he'll be handing over to Patrick Blakeney Edwards. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes in a little while. Meanwhile, there's some, uh, still some good racing going on further back, some quite close battles. Sue Derbyshire is still only just a, a tiny fraction ahead of Alan Middleton. He's in the Aston Martin Speed Red Dragon. Um, but Sue is holding on to seventh in the, in the three-wheeler Morgan. Um, and there's quite a group of cars that are all together there as our race leader comes around. So we've got a little gaggle here going on as well as uh, they head around tight section of the loop and through Aintree Bend and back out onto the Wellington Strait. So there we are, we can see there is Sue Darbyshire in that number four time. Now she's just maybe up a little bit more of a gap over Middleton, but not by much. The Middleton oh, actually is just yeah, ahead. Sorry, just yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. through, yes. And uh, Alan Middleton, the 21 car, is a black Aston Martin speed model, unusually, because most of them were red. The reason it's black is it, in its original uh, production from the factory it was uh, produced for Richard Seaman the later the Grand Prix driver for the Mercedes team pre-war uh, who raced this in Northern Ireland at the Ards TT circuit and it was
presented for him in his normal colour of black. Later on, it was owned by a private owner called Dudley Folland, who was a Welshman, so he put the Red Dragon on the side for Wales. But it looks wonderful, doesn't it? But he, Alan Middleton has gone ahead of Sue uh, Dovish, so actually, yeah, there you are, the graphic has confirmed that. Middleton now in seventh, Sue has dropped down to eighth, but she's still fighting hard up there in the top ten. You can see the way she leads into the corner through Stowe Corner. It's a long, long right-hander, so she keeps the way from the inside of the car as much as possible, and then flicking it into the left and right at club. And demonstrating lovely technique, really good line, perfect onto the apex, not letting it run too wide, and out of club corner, coming around to complete another lap. We've still got 25 minutes to go, but the pit stops will be coming up soon. Nice little race going on further back there. Number 25 is Jonathan Turner in the Triumph Dolomite. Uh, he'll be handing over to Ben Cussons when they do make their pit stop, but uh, yeah, they're all uh, having a good little tussle in that group, aren't they? They are, yeah, that's a great shot, isn't it? Five cars uh, coming down the hangar straight into Stowe Corner and uh, a change of position there with the number four, uh, Edward Bradley, that's Richard's father, in the Aston Martin Ulster, just making up a place as he goes through Stowe Corner. Yeah, so let's see how they can uh, go. Are we going to see people starting to make those pit stops soon? I think it won't be too long before we see that. Uh, but for now, everyone's staying out there, putting in some strong performances. Still fast as that belonging to our race leader. Uh, Fred is maintaining an advantage. Fred Wakeman out in front right now. Uh, Sue Derbyshire, ah, I think it's like she's got herself back into seventh, according to the uh, classification there. Have a look at that in a moment. The Invicta up on the inside. Uh, that is the Invicta S-Type. Lovely car to see. And... Uh, actually won the Monte Carlo rally back in 1931 in the days when cars did rallying and racing there wasn't such a big difference really it, you know they, they competed whether it was off-road or on-road it was tarmac uh, Monte Carlo rally anyway so uh, yeah, all good stuff yes the rallying at the time wasn't like the rallying we see these days over the uh, the rough forest tracks still very hard indeed because they would run for many days whereas most rallies these days are somewhat shorter uh, the pit window is open and uh, we should see we've got the first pit caller there perhaps the number 99 car of uh, Robin Tolui is coming to hand over to Bjorn Yekla they're running in fourth place uh, now I was wrong Fred Wakeman didn't come into the pits the next time around uh, he was just acknowledging his pit crew have holding out his uh, board for him but uh, he will come in at some point over the next 10 minutes. Um, because he and Patrick Blakeney Edwards are so equally matched in terms of their speed, they, they generally split the race about halfway or a little bit in favour of Fred, who is the owner of the car. Still a great battle going on here between uh, Jonathan Turner and Phil Champion. Jonathan uh, Turner racing in the Triumph Dolomite, and Phil Champion is racing in the Super Sports, the uh, red machine there, number 10. Is for the champion, and he's doing a fine job. He was due to share the car originally, but I think he's going to change the plan. I think Phil will be doing the whole race himself. And we are, as I say, beginning to see a few more cars heading into the pits. But even if you're doing it as a solo race, you must do your pit stop for the allotted time. Uh, so they obviously don't gain any advantage over those who are sharing their cars. We're going to see this in quite a few races as we go through the day. Uh, races of around 45, 50 minutes with driver changes throughout. Some drivers decide to stick with their car for the entire duration. And there we are looking at number 75, and that is uh, Steve Skip. Uh, sorry, it's James Dean at the moment. He will be handing over to Steve Skipworth later on. Another of the Aston Martins. This is the Monoposto Speed model uh, from uh, 1939. Uh, holding on to pretty good performance at the moment. That is the, uh, yeah, you'll see cars dropping down, picking back up. So it'll take a few laps now before we kind of get back into the full normal order. And we've got some good battles going on, some good wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing here, and some wonderful noises from these uh, from these old engines as well. Yeah, the Bugatti's in there. So yeah, so we haven't actually seen that on camera yet. Let's uh, focus on that. That's uh, a Type 35B 
Bugatti, the type of car with a supercharger on the Type 35B, type of car that won the very first Monaco Grand Prix in 1929, driven by uh, an Englishman named William Grover Williams, who uh, disappeared during the Second War. He was part of the uh, uh, the underground in uh, Paris, working out of a Bugatti dealership uh, secretly, under the noses of the uh, the Germans who were in Paris and. Uh, he uh, sadly disappeared, but uh, he was the winner of the very first Monaco Grand Prix in a car very similar to that. Yeah, Martin Hulus are making up some good progress. He's so he uh, gradually coming up. He's in 17th position. I don't know whether he had a problem on the opening lap or something because uh, he did start in ninth place originally, but uh, I wonder if something went wrong. But it, the Bugatti seems to be running very well now. There's our race leader back with number 11, our race leader. There he is. Uh, not into the pits as yet to hand over to Pat Blakeney Edwards and still opening up a very, very useful advantage. He's got a nearly 30 second gap now over the others. The Fraser Nash is enjoying this Silverstone circuit extremely well, I think. As uh, comes up behind car number nine, that's Chris Lunn in the Talbot 105. Funnily enough, I saw that car in Bury St Edmunds last week. It was on display at a, an event that was uh, put on by the West Suffolk Motor Club and it was sitting uh, in the market square at Bury St Edmunds and now it's nice to see it out there racing. Uh, lovely, yes, yes. Uh, most of the owners of these cars uh, will uh, put them out in their local areas for displays because they are just so beautiful and we don't see them generally on the road anymore. And, uh, we should see, I think, the leader come into the pits this time around. The pit window is still open but uh, it will be closing in the next couple of laps so he may well choose to come in. The danger if you leave your pit stop till the very end of the pit window is that it's then safe to stay back. You might actually miss the window to come in. So most of the drivers will try and get their pit stops done early on in the, in the window. Yep, let's uh, see how that goes. As you say, a little bit of time to go. They've got to keep to speed limits as well when they come into the pits. Otherwise, they will pick up penalties. So that's all uh, pretty important for them as well. Uh, the speed lane. Uh, Lane speed limit is 60 kilometers now, and of course, uh, you know, some, speeders, uh, some of these older cars, so uh, they will have to be uh, a little bit uh, too quickly. Um, they're the pre war sports cars, uh, they've got until 30 minutes uh, into the race before they have to have made uh, that pit stop, and they must rest for at least uh, 15 seconds during the uh, pit stop, regardless of whether they can drive a change or not. No. Sue Derbyshire's again in that little gaggle of cars battling against the Riley <laughs> and just about staying in front. There are those four overtaking a slower car as they make their way around. And uh, into, oh, we have a spinner there, that's the number 25 car, which has had a big spin. It's Jonathan Turner's uh, sharing with Ben Cousins, that's the Triumph Dolomite that you uh, briefly mentioned earlier on, having a quick spin. But leading that group of cars is the Aston Martin speed model, the Red Dragon as it's been, been called. Sue's caught it back up because uh, Alan got past her a little while ago, uh, but now it looks as though, if anything, Sue's got a little bit more pace with the Morgan. She's actually picked up a bit of a toe. He's going to have a little think about attacking into Brooklyn's corner. Let's have a look. Is she going to go for it? Down the inside, not quite the change. Just because that a little bit on uh, speed on entry. So Alan stays in position for the moment. That's in seventh place. Sue is in eighth position. And then they're being chased uh, by the number 37 car still of Alexander Hewitson, the Riley, which has been a part of this battle. Again, Sue's got a chance here. Running side by side. The Morgan versus the Aston Martin. How wonderful to see this. Sue is not giving up. She is throwing everything into this race. Really wonderful to see. So uh, great to see the drivers working so hard. And Sue Derbyshire goes through on the inside of Cox Corner. Uh, so you can overtake the car. Sue Derbyshire. Without makes going off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sue Derbyshire makes her way around the inside of Alan Middleton and takes that seventh place. Uh, uh, so that will update uh, on your screens next time around when they cross the timing line. But uh, we can see on track that Sue has made up that place. Yeah, beautifully done. Look at those little skinny tyres. Look how much uh, grip there isn't 
with those little tiny skinny tyres, the car drifting around, and yet there she is pushing it flat out all the time. Really wonderful images. And this front and the engine sitting right at the front, but driving the rear wheel through a chain drive. And she's sitting over the top of that area where the chain runs through the car. And then she's leaning in one way and then the other, heading down the hangar straight into Stoke Corner. Wonderful display here. And, uh, well, yeah, Middleton and Hewitson not quite keeping up right now. Uh, also following um, another of the big Bentleys, that's James Morley in his uh, 1925 car. That's one of the what's called Bentley three, four and a half. And originally it could have had a three liter engine, but the uh, Bentleys then went to the, the four and a half uh, liter motor. Uh, you can see it is at the back of that little group, sliding around a bit, much, much heavier car, of course, puts more strain on the tires. And actually the Aston Martin coming under pressure from the Riley, back with our race leader, there he is. Looks like Fred's doing a good number of laps before yeah. he's handing over today. I, I think based on the fact they've got a good lead and they're very evenly matched, as I mentioned earlier, and Fred is the owner of the car, he's just taking uh, the chance to have a, a longer race than he'll hand over to his co-driver, Patrick Blakeney-Edwards. He's looking so you're over... you're right, he's slowing down a little bit Is there. he? Yes, he... Or is he OK? I know he's lapping another car. I was wondering... No, uh, it looks OK. I think okay. he was just having a chat. OK. Yeah, they, they, did, they do that. They talk to each other because they can see each other uh, out of it. But it did very much look like he it was slowing, didn't point. it? Yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. think he's OK. The car's yeah. still sliding nicely through Stoke Corner. Uh, so yeah, looks all right here. Looks as though he's still pushing on pretty hard. There's massive respect between drivers in this, uh, in this kind of car of racing. And there has to be because it's not, it's not the safest form of motorsport. If you have an accident, one of these things, you're thrown out of the car. That's how it used to be. And, and in fact, drivers at one time uh, felt more like motorbike riders. They felt safer by being thrown out of the car than being in the car and squashed by it. Uh, of course, that then changed post-war when it became safer to be strapped into the car and let the chassis protect you from damage. But in the old days, people were thrown out. And, and often they would survive uh, a horrible incident being thrown out, but of course, often they, they uh, suffered some very grievous injuries. Um, so to see people in this modern era racing cars like this, we're still pushing hard, you know, still around. around. Silverstone is a great place for this because you've got lots of runoff area, you've got very safe curves as well, generally, that are not going to suddenly flick the car uh, over. So it is a great place, and they feel good confidence here, I think. I, I think they do, and there's plenty of space for them. They don't need to go out over the, uh, the, the bigger curves. And I think we'll see Wakeman come in this time because we've only got three minutes till the end of the pit window and uh, the lap is taking nearly that. So he, I don't think he'll want to risk another lap. Clive Morley, we're watching now the number 22, Bentley, running in third place. He's also uh, uh, hasn't been in the pits yet. He's driving solo. Okay. So I think we're about to see a, a rush of pit stops. Yeah, they're all leaving it to quite the last moment, which is interesting. Yeah. I thought they would uh, do it a little bit earlier, but they're leaving it till the last moment before making their, their pit stops in this race. We've still got uh, just under 13 minutes remaining in what is race two here at the Classic at Silverstone. Ben Edwards and Alistair Douglas talking you through the race. And we've got Ed Foster who will be picking up the winners at the end of the race as well. Get in touch using uh, my Twitter feed at Ben Edwards TV. Give us some comments on what you'll see if you are watching on the live stream or perhaps you are in the grandstands. The race leader has come into the pits and we've got a driver change going on now as Fred Wakeman has handed the car over to Pat Blakeney Edwards. Pat picks up the power and off he goes. And Pat is a very rapid driver. We're going to see a lot of these guys uh, throughout the course of the weekend. They're driving in different machinery, in different classes. Yes, pa Patrick uh, prepares the cars uh, through his company for Fred and then shares the driving with him as well. Patrick's also out in another car, a different owner that he prepares a car for, but uh, I think Fred and Patrick are probably the most uh, busy drivers this weekend with all the different cars that Fred owns. <laughs> well, yes, we've got, uh, don't forget, we've also got uh, kind of Lockheed uh, doing a yeah, lot of races, isn't he? Julian Thomas is saying he owns yeah. a huge number of cars and uh, Callum Lockheed is his professional driver that he always uh, has along with him. Uh, and they're certainly uh, almost the same number and a number of other drivers we'll see out on multiple occasions throughout the weekend. So another little battle going on here as our race leader has come back out and still uh, got a good advantage of course all the gaps will sort of settle down once we've seen everybody has made their pit stop. I think most people actually have now 
done their pit stop, looking at our tiny screen, I think the majority are either in the pits or have made their pit stop now. Uh, Pat Blakeney Edwards picking up the pace. I wonder if he's going to set a new fastest lap. The, it was his, uh, his man, Fred, who set the fastest lap in the first stint at a 2 minute 48.4. Uh, we'll see, he's on his outback now, so it'll be the next lap where we get a bit of a better indication of it. I see the team in the pits actually fixed that flapping bonnet strap uh, at the stop as well, because it uh, when we had shots of... Oh, it's, it's flapping the other side now. <laughs> oh, it was the left-hand side, or the driver's side of the car, the right-hand side, that was originally flapping, it's now the left. But uh, Patrick and Fred, when you speak to them about driving this car, they just have such a big smile, they absolutely love driving it, but it is quite scary because you are, you do feel very exposed, you're sat out in the breeze and uh, they actually do hold on with their uh, with their legs to, to make sure they don't slide around in the car. I'm sure, yes, it's not like being strapped in a harness in a modern racing no. car, um, so you, physically it's pretty tough, you're hanging on to the steering wheel, you're hanging on with your, with your feet as well, there is that uh, car we saw earlier on, the Torbert. Um, that uh, is out there, the 105 Brooklands, green 1933 car. engine, and running pretty strongly at the moment, I have to say. And that was the English Talbot, as opposed to the French Talbot, which we saw earlier, the, the blue car of Richard Pilkington, the Talbot. Uh, but this one was a team car, so it has a huge amount of history. And uh, Michael Birch, a, a very quick driver, another driver we'll see out in multiple cars. It's a very easy car to drive. We're back now with Sue Derbyshire, and interesting to contrast her car with that great big uh, Aston, well, relatively big Aston Martin, uh, the Red Dragon Speed model, uh, which has got back past again. So uh, Alan Middleton, who's also driving solo, um, has managed to catch and pass Sue Derbyshire. Again. We've had these two together the whole race, haven't we, Ben? Yeah, it's been a great battle between them, and uh, it must be pretty tiring by this day. <laughs> yet again with Alan, and they have been enjoying a wonderful battle throughout. Let's see who's going to come out on top. Uh, Alan is now into seventh place, Sue is back now in eighth position, and uh, we'll just see Andrew Goodson move up one position once again. He's been a part of this battle pretty much throughout. Sorry, Alexander Hewitson in the Riley it is. Alex uh, has been a part of this battle as well. He's a bit further back, I think, after the pit stops than he was. Trying to see him in the background. Yeah, just see him coming out of Luffield now. But Alex may be able to, to join in with this race once again. And they are coming up to lap one of the... Richard started the race, but Tanya has now taken it over, and they are actually yeah, catching that car. Yeah, it's coming under pressure towards the end of the race after the pit stops, and it looks like maybe Alan Middleton and possibly Sue Derbyshire will go through, uh, and that will move them both up a place to sixth and seventh. And then ahead of them is the uh, Steve Skipworth now. Uh, Jim Dean started, Steve Skipworth taken over in the Aston Martin in fifth place. Bentley of James Morley putting a bit more pressure on Alex in the Riley. There you can see as they head down the hangar straight. The big Bentley is much more than the Riley, but actually in terms of straight line pace, you can see it's not a huge difference. The Bentley now is gaining a bit of an advantage and has got past. So the number 85 car, James Morley, has gained a position. That's put him into ninth place now. The line is quick through the corners, as you can see. So the Bentley has, Bentley has that little bit more straight line speed. But the Riley is very effective through the turns. Up front, Pat Blakeney Edwards uh, still leading this race in the car that uh, Fred Wakeman started out in. And uh, they have a useful advantage of some 25 seconds. No new fastest lappers yet. Still fastest lappers from earlier. Riley coming back at the Bentley. We're now coming up to a more twisty section where the Riley 
probably has a bit more of an advantage. So they're almost side by side into Abbey Curve. And then as they come out of that corner, the Riley's got a bit more speed and will perhaps have a chance through farm and then up towards village. This is where you can break pretty late. The Bentley may have to break a bit earlier, but he does hold the inside line, fair enough. And uh, the Riley is forced to go in wide. Good stuff. And the Riley goes through on the switch back up towards the left-hander at the loop. But the Bentley's got the inside line. But uh, I think the Riley driver will try to cut tight through Aintree. But uh, it looks like uh, Morley has held that line through the left-hander. But no, they're absolutely side by side as they go out onto the Wellington Straight. Once again, the great example of the respect between these drivers. They gave each other plenty of room. And uh, it's actually the Bentley of uh, Stuart Morley. Alexander Hewitson as they come down into Brooklands. The Riley has another little nibble on the inside, but no way through there. No, but it is still good racing, as you say. Um, and meanwhile, the, uh, the Pilkington car is still under pressure from Middleton and Derbyshire up ahead, so we could see a few little changes. Uh, we haven't seen too much of the Steve Skidworth and Aston Martin just recently. That's currently running in fifth place. Um, they are their own, I think, at this stage. So there is still in the mix, I think. Maybe uh, drop back a little bit from Middleton over the last time. I don't think it's a huge gap, though, so we'll see if there are any changes. Four and a half minutes to go in the pre-war BRDC 500 at Silverstone, the second race of the day with some glorious machinery, the oldest cars that we're going to see on track racing over the course of this weekend. Um, but glorious machinery and being driven some of them to their absolute limit and others just on a rather lovely cruise around the 3.6 miles Silverstone circuit what a wonderful place to drive your favorite car and James Morley managing to get through on the inside of a slower car there to keep ahead of Alexander Hewitts and this battle still goes on and now we're back with the leader again Patrick Clayton Edwards PBE as he's known and is on his helmet as you'll see when he comes through the left-hander uh, in the Fraser Nash, yep. holding on to that great big steering wheel, similar to Sue Derbyshire, big steering wheel, no power steering, of course, in these cars, so you have to really hold them around and uh, making his way through the field. Yeah, lovely to watch. Pat sits a little lower in the car, gives him an advantage over his teammate Fred, doesn't it? Because Fred's quite tall, yes. and of course he, we saw Fred ducking down down the straights to try and reduce the drag. Uh, Pat's got a bit of an advantage in that uh, yes, sense. Yes, yes, slightly behind the aero screen as he comes up to Cops Corner, flings the car in and uh, leans over. He's a very demonstrative driver, uh, Patrick is. Uh, he loves to move around in the car and uh, get the car moving around under him as well as he goes over the rise into Maggot's Curve. Doing a fantastic job. So let's see if uh, that, uh, he's going to get another lap, I think, out of this. Uh, so we're on probably what will be the penultimate lap of this race. And they look on, they're looking on for a, a very comfortable victory, but he's still sliding it around, still balancing the car. He's just enjoying himself. It's so lovely to drive a car like this that has wonderful balance, and you can get into a four-wheel drift through some of these long, fast corners at Silverstone. There's plenty of space, and the wonderful thing is there's good runoff as well. So you can be confident, you can try hard. If you go a little bit wide, you're not going to be in too much trouble uh, now there's the car that's running in second place the number 20 michael birch talbot uh, that's going very strongly at this stage as well beautiful green livery and uh, michael's helmet there really shining in the we've got a little bit of sunshine now not we've still got quite a lot of gray cloud above us but thankfully we haven't got the rain that we suffered uh, through a lot of the qualifying day the track is now bone dry pretty much i would say and they're able to enjoy that and have some fun Oh, so here we go, over the line, uh, minute 50, so it may well actually be the last lap yes. now. I think he's just acknowledged the, uh, the start line marshal who's held out the last lap board, and he just lifted his, uh, his left hand there to acknowledge that. Very courteous drivers, both Fred and Patrick. Uh, we're back now with this midfield battle with Sue Derbyshire, still working hard. As you said earlier, it's hard work and it's a long yeah. race isn't it and they, they must be quite fit to uh, to keep these cars right on the limit must be quite a big fuel tank here as well in, in, in little morgan because you know you're doing a quite a long race it's flat out uh, the whole time i bet the fuel uh, fuel economy isn't that fantastic on cars of this age 
Yeah, it's a, only only a twin cylinder, but uh, yeah. yes, it uh, it will use a fair bit of fuel over the, the time. Um, but it's a very basic car, just a wooden frame with a, a body slung over the top of it. Really, no thought given to the driver uh, comforts in these cars. <laughs> As we come back to Patrick Blakeney Edwards, who's driving the leading car on the last lap of the race. You can see the clock ticking down. The flag will go out when he comes round to the international pit straight. Yeah, lovely slide and a lovely little corner. The back end of the car under wonderful control through steering and throttle. But the right foot on the throttle is just as important as the steering control in cars like this. And he's been putting on a great display, as was his teammate Fred Wakeman earlier on, who led from the start of the race from pole position. And they have taken full advantage with this car. Their uh, lead up to over 30 seconds over the number 20 machine of Michael Birch, who's hanging on there in second place. Birch has got quite a comfortable advantage himself over the number 22 car of Clive Morley, who's going to be the first of the Bentleys, I think, to come home. It looks like he's going to get the podium finish. Fourth place is heading the way of the number 99 car of Ewan Dentley and Robin Tui. It's Ewan in the car now, another of the Bentleys. That's running in fourth position. And then in fifth place is the 75 Aston Martin monoposto of James Dean with Steve, Steve Skipworth in the car now. James started the race with Steve Skipworth actually running that car that's run in fifth place. I don't think uh, we're seeing any particularly close battles, although actually the Pilkingtons versus Middleton is still pretty close. Yes, it was last time around, just 0.7 between them, but uh, haven't spotted them out on track, so we'll have to wait and perhaps till they come over the line to see how close that one is. But I, I get the feeling Middleton was going to get that place as we watch uh, Patrick Blakeney Edwards coming through the last sequence of corners into Club Corner through the long right-hander. He's probably going to not pass that car ahead of him. There's no need for him to do so. Uh, and there's a point as well that, that car will get an extra lap. The checker flag is out and victory in the pre-war BRDC 500 goes to Fred, Fred Wakeman and Pat Blakeney Edwards. I gather you had a few gearbox problems, but you made that look easy. Yeah, we, uh, we had, I was greeted with bad news this morning that we only had the first well, really three gears. So we had to make a decision whether we were going to go with fourth gear or third. Uh, and uh, we chose third. That was the right choice. We were really ringing the heck out of that engine. But uh, really happy with the win. We got pole and fastest lap. So couldn't be better. Well done to you. Next to Michael Birch from eighth to second. You must be happy with that. I'm very happy. on a great race with Clive for much of the race. That was a lot of fun. Trying to catch these guys. But yeah, not this year, but maybe next year. So yeah, it was great. Thanks. And finally, to third place, Clive Morley. Let's just move along. Clive, what a wonderful way to start the day, piloting that Bentley at yeah. Silverstone. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I couldn't have gone on for much longer. My arms are killing me. So, uh, but it was a wonderful, uh, very hard third, I must admit. No, it was fabulous, thank you. Well done to all of you.